All right, welcome. It is the BRS 160 or 52 weeks of reefing update. Last week was all the successes. We gave a little bit of the secret sauce mm. or whatnot. This week, all the fails. Yeah. yeah. All the things we did wrong, for sure. Yeah, stuff that didn't work, you know, the, the lessons learned. This is probably the most valuable of these update episodes is this one right here, where you can learn from our mistakes and make sure you don't do it on your take. All right, so we've got a whole bunch of them. We'll share all of them with you. Get to hear all the background on it. And the first one is, I burned out an Apex uh, outlet. Uh, oh, yeah. With a heater, right? And so this is the age-old question, right? Do you use your aquarium controller to control the heater as uh -huh. the primary thermostat? Okay. And then back up, like set your heater a couple of degrees above that, right? Uh, or do you use the thermostat inside of your heater and then back that up with your controller, and there is a very right question. There's a ton of different ways you can debate it, but I definitely got the best idea. So we're talking about putting the heating element straight into my energy bar 832 mm -hmm. and letting, uh, setting my parameters and letting that outlet toggle on, toggle off, toggle on, toggle off, mm -hmm. or plugging in my BRS heater controller cool. and letting it have a wider range so that my controller turns the heating element off and off and off and on. Okay. So, there, here's the answers. One of these two things is just gonna stay on for the most part, yeah. right, unless the other thing fails, uh, and it'll be the backup. The other one's gonna turn on and off like a million times, right? Yeah. And by a million times a year, if you actually do the math on it, it really is that. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, there is a right answer, and the right answer is how much that each one of these things cost. So if I know for sure that turn one of these things on and off a million times a year is going to wear it out, yeah. the one that only turns off uh, almost never uh, on and off has very few duty cycles, going to last a really long time, which one would I like to wear out first? My $300 EB-8 uh, outlet <laughs> or my $50 heater? Uh, $50 heater. $50 all the, so we learned the hard way here. Mm -hmm. Obviously had one burnt out. Uh, luckily we have a warehouse full so we could swap them out. But to the average reefer, I don't have 300 bucks to replace uh, right, right off the bat. I have 300 bucks. I don't want to do that. No. You had to go reprogram all the outlets? Yeah. yeah no. Uh, you're probably going to like pull one thing out and then just be out an outlet. Who wants to do that? The seven out of eight? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. And we also learned that we kind of set it at like zero you know, point oh, 0.1 degrees or something really like that. Really tight swings, so which on, makes on, it, on, on, on. yeah. Don't do yeah. that anymore. <laughs> uh, I give it like a half a degree swing or so. I uh, let it's it reasonable. turn off with like way, maybe even a degree. I yeah, it's know, reasonable. Right? So the next one is 20 inch height. Oh yeah, so I mean, especially from, a, so you go look at the the, uh, the BR7, uh, the 750 XXL, that's a taller tank. Yeah, so we're talking uh, 20 inches height yeah. of this tank, that's what this is. Oh, and, and okay, so for those of you stickheads in SPS, you know, if you want SPS dominant and things like that, the stuff grows like super tall and it's hard to account for when you're kind of setting this up. So I mean, if you've done it before and you set up a few of these things, you've, you've probably been around the block and you can say, all right, I know like these stags can grow, you know, upwards of 20 some inches. Well, that's the whole distance of my tank right here. That means I have no rock work in there. So mm -hmm. 20 inch height, uh, especially trying to get flow over the top of those things, really hard to do. But if I had to do it over again, especially with an SPS tank, I would never go below 24 inches. You just need all of that yeah. height because the corals grow upward, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, some of the other corals don't really do that and you can kind of place them lower and stuff and it's just not as big of a deal. So if I was just doing an LPS tank, this tank's just fine. Uh, and even really for an SPS tank, it's just mm. fine. But if I'm going to do it over, uh, for me, a fail is picking it to be too short. Yeah. Well, I mean, built right into that, too, is another fail, and that's the rock work, where you mm. set the rock work uh, too high up in that shorter tank height, and now you're, you're, now you're defeating the purpose, and you're battling both fronts. So, one, I already have a short height to work with. Now I've made it even shorter by making a tall aquascape. Yeah, so the aquascape that we built was, like, for a video. We wanted to look like decent, you know. Day one. Day one, yeah. You know? And honestly, aquascapes on camera, you just, it's a 2D image. You just don't get the 3D element of it. So, like, it looked cool in person, but on, yeah. on camera, actually, even then, it still didn't really <laughs> achieve the goal. Now, man, I'm going to tell everybody out there, if you're going to grow sticks and uh, have acros and whatnot, like, don't go beyond the 50% line in the mm. tank. You don't want to go any higher than 50%. You want to be able to leave room for coral growth and some water to go over the top. Yeah. Even here, I mean, you can see, like, if you come out here, like, how many corals are growing out of the top of the tank. You know, they're, they're just collecting <laughs> algae in the top. 
So yeah, uh, definitely that. I'd also go one more dimension to uh, right. a fail on my front. Like if I could do it again, 30 inches front to back, right? Oh, Rather yeah. than 24. Depth is, is so, so, so important with a tank and really cool aquascapes. You kind of got to get a custom tank made to achieve that, I guess. So it's not really available at all kind, any kinds. But well, And there's benefits in there as far as flow around all of those mm -hmm. tanks. I got to tell you, I haven't done this perfect in any tank, uh, to be honest. But I really want to in the future. And that's build, have room to build an aquascape where everything isn't just piled against the back, where yeah. all the detritus lands and like, you can't get any flow around that. So only flow is in the front instead of creating like, you know, gyres and actually you mm -hmm. know, chaos in the tank. So like that 30 inches, that extra six inches from 24 to going to 30 allows you to be able to put flow in the back, not pile everything up against the back of the tank and, you know, create something really kind of cool, especially when you look down the side where you see all of the coral kind of piled together. Yeah. Uh, this often in many tanks, the best view is actually through the side. So. Well, I think uh, in speaking again to the rock work portion, like I learned a lesson personally from uh, Sean's 2000 gallon tank where he's got these big rock structures, but they're, you can go through them. They're like cavernous. So it's almost like branch rock sitting upside down or he's kind of molded a bunch of archways in a way that gives him height, but gives him open space underneath to allow a lot of that flow. And then it's just really cool too. All right, so flow, let's just like dig right into it. There's some things I liked, I didn't like, a bunch of failures actually in here. <laughs> there uh, was. I don't know, none of them were total failures, but there's things that like you're just like trying to always perfect it, yeah. right? And so uh, let's start with the very first one, which is... Yeah, these were the, the tunes pumps. So we had four of them uh, placed on either side of the tank, kind of pushing at each other, all linked together so we could run, uh, they were DC controllable, so we could run like a chaotic type pattern, kind of randomness to them. Uh, I really liked them in that they were some, they're some of the only pumps that really can push water all the way across a six foot tank. A single pump, you can see, like if you put air in there and you can see the bubbles, it can really shoot water across the side. Tank. So just hot tip for you guys. Uh, there's different sizes of these pumps yeah. and they do different things. The ones with nozzles that are really short and wide yeah. uh, have a wide angle. The ones that are have a smaller cone on the front and it's longer, direct the flow direct forward. So right. you can get more velocity out of it, right? Yeah. So just look for that and you can just visually see which one is designed for one. Smaller cone that is longer is uh, more directional, wider is wider. So there's some things that I actually liked about this one. Yeah, I think this one, you were, one of the biggest ones was directional. I can aim it. Yeah. Almost none of the other ones can you like, really aim. Like, you can kind of like, some of them you kind of get like where you kind of want it to go or whatnot. But not left, right, up, down, 180 yeah. degrees, all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. like the vortex, just straight, mm. right? Uh, the uh, gyres is, I mean, if you really want to do the gyres, roughly straight across the top. Yeah. You can aim it if you want, but it like, kind of defeats the purpose a little bit. True. Uh, so these guys, man, with uh, the tunes, you can actually, you know, the only one that really can go like almost 360 degrees. Like almost. Pretty much everywhere, right? <laughs> almost. You, can, you can go all the way up, all the way down, and you can turn it, spin it, so it yeah. goes everywhere. Yeah. So that was a really nice piece of it. Yeah, I like the battery backup option for these tunes too. Mm. Is I can go choose a DC. I can go choose a DC battery any size I want to. I, they have the plug-in piece to it, and I'm backed up for. If I choose a small battery, I'm backed up for a certain amount of time. If I choose a bigger battery, even longer amount of time. But it was so easy to implement a battery backup on that, and mm. it was buy an accessory, buy your battery from any battery store, and I'm covered. And you're not paying like tunes markup on uh, battery, yeah. BRS markup on battery. Go to Batteries Plus. <laughs> yeah, right? I did like that. As I a do commodity like that. thing. So this is the only thing I didn't like. Uh, there were so many things to like about that implementation. The only thing I didn't like is they're so big and there's so many cords in the tank. It's true. Yeah, four right. four massive thick cords. You got to run them out the back and then run them through the wall, and it does get a little messy. And it's just all this stuff man it's just magnets and cords and there's just so many of them and so especially in a tank that's kind of short they become like more obvious in the tank yeah i will say that i saw over at sean's tank that we visited yeah. uh, recently oh yeah the implementation where the cord kind of like went through the sea swirl or yep. whatnot and all you could really see is a pump and it kind of spun back and forth yeah you know that was that was actually a, a really good implementation of uh, uh tunes and and also of a pump, we didn't have to have magnets on the outside of the tank, which are ugly. 
and uh, like kind of ruin the you know side view of a lot of tanks. True. And you just see the pump, and every tank's got pumps, but you don't have to see all the wonky cords and stuff yeah, it was the same a way. Solid implementation. Yeah, absolutely like that. So uh, we tried some different, you know, just to try to kind of get away from the cords and stuff. And the next one was the gyre, right? Yeah, this Two one. Uh, so we got the two. 80s, I believe, on the sides, or 250s on the sides, um, uh, when we first put them on there. Now they're the, they're the 350s. Uh, but this one came from that idea of this intersecting point of turbulence and these creating these currents in the tank where I can change where the pumps meet by one going down while one going up and one going up while one going down, and that changes like this flow pattern across the tank. Yeah, so if that one's on uh, 20% and this one's on uh, 100% or 80, point of turbulence is probably right behind Randy, right? Uh, and then if I change it to this one's 20% and that one's 80, the point of turbulence is right, probably right behind me. And so it just kind of shifted and it's creating currents that are pretty strong in the tank. We really like that idea. Yeah. Yeah, dislike on this one, especially when I was maintained in the tank, is the maintenance on the gyres is more than what I'd like to do. So mm. they do get, they get clogged up really fast. We grow coralline algae in this tank uh, faster than most any tanks I've seen. Uh, so these, once you clean the gyres, you probably have about a month or two uh, before it just coralline builds up on it. That's not accounting for like other buildups, so some algaes and some detritus or whatever's uh, clogging them up. Uh, so they do need to be, tamed, be maintained. Like any pump, I guess, in the same situation would need to be maintained as much. It's just this one has a little more moving parts, a little longer, wider pieces, more surface area, um, more chance of these things getting clogged up. So, I mean, there's two pieces of this. One, what we were doing was actually totally disassembling the thing mm. at the time. And it, there's a lot more parts to this thing than there are a lot of other pumps, especially when you disassemble them. And it's, you know, just like you don't want to break anything, put it back together yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So, in hindsight, I think a lot of the maintenance could have been done actually just inside of a bucket with some, uh, I mean, that's what we're doing now anyway, a bucket with some citric acid and yeah. water and just let it run in there and you'll get most of the stuff off. It's not as good as a complete disassembly, but like if you're not going to do the disassembly all the time, there's a way better option. Mm. The thing that I didn't like uh, is that I'd spend all this time trying to get the perfect settings for it. I'd like put these air bubble or air line in the top and suck the air line and I'd watch the bubbles and where they were going. And then like two weeks later, it'd be at like 30% power and it wouldn't be doing the thing that I thought it was Bec gonna do. Because it was dirty. Yeah. yeah. And, and then after two weeks, it kind of stays there for a really long time. There just seems to be a difference between perfectly clean and <laughs> a couple of weeks of dirty that you know reduces the output 30%. So that was really the only thing, man. And if you could just kind of set it a little too high for a couple of weeks, uh, you'd probably be good. You probably don't have to do that. Right? Yeah. Uh, so ultimately though, uh, after talking to uh, Josh at WWC, we moved on to the next option, which is the one that you see behind us right now, which is two MP40s on each side and the gyres. And the gyres. Gyres yeah. shooting water uh, across the top, creating those currents. The uh, MP40s on the front shooting water across the front. There's an MP40 in the back shooting water across the back and flushing out you know, pockets of stuff out of everywhere. Ultimately, this has been the best so far. So far, and I mean, lessons learned if we're talking about fails and stuff here, uh, really it kind of ties in, all of this ties in together with that height of the tank, the rock work and aquascape, and if we were gonna do it all over now with this understanding of flow, you'd change all of those dynamics to get the flow right from the from the beginning, in which case would probably be like, maybe like we have on the 750, where there's two MP60s in the front MP40s in the back, top and bottom, to kind of stir up the whole mess. Mm -hmm. So uh, ultimately, man, I mean, we call the, these uh, kind of didn't work, didn't work, there, and work uh, or fails or whatnot. But like, this is probably what I would go with again. Now, the one caveat to that is this does tons and tons of flow, and it isn't cheap. Right? Yeah, it's true. Uh, and so. And we kind of recreated the old problem at the same time, which is there's now lots of pumps and cords. I've kind of ruined the end uh, side of the view of the tank because there's so many pumps on it yeah. now. Uh, so, you know, maybe the tunes is, uh, you know, and their cords were ultimately a good option in the beginning, could have stuck with it. This is just way more flow though in the end. And so, especially being a bare bottom tank now that like keeps all this stuff, you know, uh, suspended in the air or mm. in the water and gets filtered out. Mm. 
this is probably the best option we had. It's just so hard to get flow right, so I'm sure you guys have all had the same kind of problems. Uh, but you, know, you can kind of hear where we went right, where we went wrong, and uh, some of the areas we could see some improvement. So that comment about the bare bottom flows probably into the biggest uh, fail that we've had to date. Yeah, the life of the tank. I think you comment on this one so many times because it was such uh, a heartbreaking event to see what happens after you destabilize the tank so much uh, from changing out the sand. So we had sand in here and we took it out and we thought we were on a path of taking it out slowly. Okay. Even as slowly as we did, still a destabilizing event. Yeah, so a lot of you, uh, unless you watch every last video we do, you wouldn't really even know why we took the sand out. Uh, mm. So I'll share it with you for those that uh, catch everybody up. Uh, we did the uh, WWWC uh, uh, hybrid method, and uh, in that method, they don't use sand, they use bare bottoms yeah. in a lot of their, and keep in mind that, you know, a lot of their tanks are like uh, grow out tanks. They're just kind of slightly different than a uh, home tank. There's lots of bare bottom home tanks too. And well, the goal here is actually to get all of the detritus and garbage out of the tank. Use yep. your filtration, use your skimmer, use your filter socks, use everything to get that garbage out of the tank rather than just let it accumulate in the sand, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, in this tank, you could definitely go in the back and stir it up and watch this big brown cloud come out. I mean, here's the thing is like, I don't know, is that bad? Is it, uh, certainly it can't be good, <laughs> I, I can't imagine. I would tell you this, if I like, siphon that out into a bucket and gave you a big brown bucket. Would you pour that back in your tank? Mm -mm. <laughs> no way, no. Man. nobody would ever do that. I don't know what it is. Uh, so like, it was just a total destabilization event for the tank. And I've since talked to a lot of people who have taken sand out and they had very similar things. Mm. Actasia explosion, brapsis, or other pastis explosion. And this is my take on it. Mm. This, is, this is my belief uh, because you know, destabilization is just like a you know a general term. It's hard to define exactly you what that means. You think you were on the verge to begin with? No, I think what happened was we were having at the time, remember, like no nutrients in the tank. Couldn't yep. even turn the fuge on more than a couple hours, a few days a week. Right? Feeding food down this thing's gullet. All yeah. right, so we destabilized the tank, and the reason that we had all no nitrate or phosphorus in the and like almost uh, none of the filtration is because the coral mass uptake in these tanks is so large, right? Mm -hmm. Corals are just sucking up all the nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank. When we destabilize the tank, the coral growth slowed Stop. way down, uh, which yeah. means there's way more nitrogen and phosphorus available for mm. these other organisms that don't really care as much, like algae and aptasia. Yeah, right? that makes sense. And so I think that's a plausible. potential, you know, plausible reason right. as to why I did that. But I don't care. I will never ever do that again. Either start bare bottom or stay sand. One of the two. And so what I got out of this, and this is just my personal belief, you know, there's all kinds of beliefs out there. This is mine in relation to sand. Uh, once I know what's in all that brown gunk in the sand, mm. I, 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 I don't want it in there. And you hear like all these like weird things like, old tank syndrome and whatnot, like my tank mysteriously died from old tank syndrome. That's not a real thing. <laughs> it just means that your tank is old, right? Yeah. Something in there, man, is building up and caused a problem over time, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at your sand bed and you're scared to touch it because toxic stuff might come out, uh, or if you see it and it's just exploding brown stuff every time it's like stirred up, that definitely gets worse every year. Yeah. Uh, unless you clean it, yeah. right? So this is my personal opinion, is I'm totally okay with having sand still. Sand looks awesome, allows me to have critters that I would normally not, or you wouldn't be able to have without sand. Um, it does mean you have to maintenance it though. Bring the effort, you put in the effort if you want the sand. I strongly believe that if you have sand, you should clean it. Mm. Uh, and then like maybe not if you have four inches of sand, which most people don't have these days. Yeah. But if you have one inch of sand, like I think long term, not like a 12 months, but like, you know, three, four, five years, your tank is gonna have way higher survivability rates if you clean your sand, at least a patch of it every time you do a water change and suck all that garbage and export it out of the tank rather than just let it build up. I haven't seen anybody's uh, tank that cleans their sand uh, not benefit from it. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of things we talk about in reefing are like, you know, maybe. my best guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, plausible maybe. theory. Mm. Maybe it did this. If like enough of us raise our hand at the same time is good enough. I can just tell you this personal experience. Uh, I know I've, I've seen a lot of tanks. 
is anybody who maintenances their sand and keeps it clean. I like the the WWC when they do have sand, like in the LPS tank they had up front, the oh, 500 yeah. or? The 293. 293, yep. That thing looked awesome, right? But they were meticulous yeah, about cleaning, cleaning the sand. Like mm -hmm. if they're gonna have sand, they're gonna suck the garbage out, yep. right? And so that's why we did it. Uh, that's. It didn't work here. We even did it one cup at a time. If anybody asked me, should I remove my sand after the fact? I'd nope. say no. You should clean just clean it. it. <laughs> uh, just clean it, you can get the same results, and you get to keep the sand that you probably put in there for a reason to begin with. Yeah. Um, so go with that. All right, so super closely related to taking sand out of the tank. What else was a total <sighs> fail for this tank? I mean, that was a destabilizing event, meaning that we made a change and we also made a change from Zeovit to Triton Method to Larger Refugium to Taking Out Sandbed to Flow. The only thing we really didn't change was lighting, I guess. But, we changed that actually three times. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess the LEDs changed in the center. So, I mean, this tank, this tank is a constant source of change. And we went completely against the grain of what we've been talking about in a lot of those different things is stability. This was something that like uh, Victor over at Worldwide said to me ah. and really just stuck. And he's like, corals are amazingly adaptive creatures if you just let them. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, huh. You know, and it really just kind of like stuck with me ever since that. Like, yeah. So almost every change that we make to the tank to like try to get improvements out of it actually has a negative result for the first three months, and then you might see that positive after that. Right? After they have acclimatized themselves to the situation, to the change. Mm -hmm. And by three months, I'm already looking for the next change. Like, the next one. Nothing happened, I'm ready to change again. So for those of you watching, for me, one of the biggest lessons I learned is limit the changes to what you do here, and you'll increase the success on almost uh, every single front. So the next one here, uh, a big fail on our end was actually the stand finish we ruined it <laughs> from allowing to allowing water to get on it salt water to get on it and not doing anything about it so what was happening uh, <clears throat> you probably can see it over here in the corner is uh, the uh, gyre was spitting up water uh, little bits every now and then and then it would drip down the glass and then land on the finish and it was happening for a really long time uh, and in this helped to say it away. Uh, <laughs> and so there's a couple of things here. A, that's all on us. Oh yeah. Don't do that. Don't do uh, that. And again, in your home environment, if this was in my home, I'd Would. just be devastated that I destroyed this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, but uh, even here I should be, but like it's a work environment, so it's a little different. But uh, the the second thing I actually learned out of this, and I, I, I think I'd like to see, you know, materialize is you know, it's, it's a piece of wood and it's a box of water. It's going to get wet, mm. right? Things of water is going to drip down it. And like, like you know, if you want to spray like uh, cleaner water, you don't want RO water getting down there every mm -hmm. day either. So, you know, with the tank, Reef Savvy builds armored seams, right? Mm. So that you can like just go right up to the edges and use your cleaner without a whole lot of worry. What if down here, instead of the transition from like uh, glass to wood, there was like stone or, or something, mm. or a lip that like a uh, like it would drip drip lip. I haven't actually like put this together yet, but it'd be really cool if that existed because you know arm it'd be like an armored ledge for your stand, so you protect the finish. Any water that does come over hits that edge and then drips on the floor. Yep. Uh, rather than on the stand. And it kind of depends on the stand or floor you have as well, I guess. But, uh, you know, really, I, I, that's a good question. That's actually. interesting. So, I don't know, this one was on us, this was a fail. A uh, small amount of water went over the edge, uh, but it went over there for a really long time. <laughs> and, cleaned it, uh, cleaned like, it off. Uh, but one of the things we'll probably do is refinish it, and we'll show you how to do it. Uh, so that'll be pretty neat to see. Yeah. All right, so the next uh, fail, I kind of talked, we kind of talked about last week. What is it? Yeah, this is uh, using a manifold. Uh, so that's what we did here. But then, you know, after a while, we come to find out that we didn't really use it. We used one of the three outlets on our manifold, which was to while. feed the recirculating skimmer. Now we don't have the recirculating skimmer, and so we have just empty manifolds. Yeah, so there's three manifolds not doing much. What I'd like to have done is plumbed it so one, that we have one pump yep. that's trying to run the manifold, all of the equipment that could be hooked up to it, and two returns. Right. It's just silly. 
So uh, I much better would have been have one pump run, one of our returns, and then another one run the equipment and uh, the pump, and then or the other return. And in that case, you know, you have redundancy, and it's just a little still uh, get the manifold, yeah. but yeah. now you have a backup pump. I still probably would have plant plumbed it the way we did in the essence that there is a manifold. So when I want to plumb uh, equipment with it, that I can. Yeah. We did have a, the, I think the Zeovit re reactor running off of it. Uh, there's a few things. That run after it. Carbon, uh, we run off of it occasionally. It's kind of a, a win and a fail at the same time. One of the fails, though, is we plumb the UV off of it. Oh, yeah. So uh, independent flow on this UV would have been, now that we know more about the, the specific type of flow for what you're targeting in the tank for the purposes of the UV, uh, it, needs its, it needs a pump. I would actually call the Plumbing on the UV terrible. Like all, all the way to just stupid. It looks great. Yeah, it looks neat, man. But what we're doing is we're taking water out of the sump and putting some portion of that water back into the UV, and some of it's going back to the tank. We're really just like sterilizing some portion of the water that goes through the sump and then send it back in. Right? Yeah. And as I understood it back in the day, part of the reason we did it was use a super jumbo one and put more water through it than we would if we had gotten the like right size for it. Mm. I thought that would compensate for it. But like, as I understand UV today, that is like a really terrible idea. So here's the thing though, is now that I know what I know about UV, uh, I, I can use it to protect my fish or I can use it to protect uh, or treat for dino, cyano, and all kinds of other, you know, pests. Bacterial tank, blooms right? and stuff, yeah. Okay, I'm actually gonna use it for the second thing. Yeah. And in the second thing, I need super high turnover. Like, you know, ick or parasites and stuff, you know, they have a, you know, a life cycle of a week or whatnot. Mm. Some of these uh, bacteria have a life cycle of hours. Yeah. Right, and a reproductive cycle, really, really short, right? So, uh, what I need to do to properly treat or pre prevent those things is cycle like almost all the water through this thing like every 10 minutes. The way it's plumbed, that will never, ever, ever <laughs> happen, right? Uh, and I'm less concerned about fish because I'm actually just quarantining or resourcing the fish properly to begin with. So like getting fish illness in the tank is just really not a huge concern mm -hmm. for me. The way it's plumbed right now, it won't achieve either one of those things. Right? Useless there. It is yeah. uh, absolutely, I would call that one of the biggest fails from an install of the equipment. Equipment's great, it's installed just poorly. Mm. So there you go. All right, so related to livestock, there's another one. Yeah, uh, especially for stickheads, a lot of you know that, that territory and real estate in your tank is uh, utmost importance, especially when it comes to you know, growing your corals out and letting them base. So encrusting corals get in the way. When they, get, when they grow enough to where they start hitting the base of your Acropora or they come up close to other ones, the encrusters usually win uh, they, and start to grow over the top of it. In almost every, uh, in almost every chance that I've, or every uh, occasion that I've seen where they've grown together, my uh, sticks lose, my encrusters win, and then it takes up all the real estate for my sticks to base out and grow big. Yeah, they tend to grow faster. Right. The encrusters, yeah. definitely. And so here's the thing for me. I wouldn't say that I'll never put an encrusting coral on a rock again. I definitely put them on like a bare bottom oh, yeah, or for islands sure. or whatnot. Uh, I'm not going to say that because some of them are really cool. They are. But I'd be really careful about where I put them in the future. Uh, we put them just kind of willy-nilly when we first started the tank. And a lot of the encrusting corals beat out the much more desirable corals mm. for me. And then they just keep getting bigger and bigger. And then it's just a big pain the butt to like keep them, you know, uh, like uh, cordoned in. You, know, you have to actually kind of calc it or do yeah. different things to like kind of keep the edges in. I think for a couple of times we Chim chiseled them. There was a, there's one encruster on here that almost didn't allow this F flow to grow. So I'd be real careful about encrusting corals. Yeah. Uh, on the show tank that I'm going to have for many, many years, because they often kind of outgrow. It's like, you know, Green zinnia, green sour polyps, zoanthids, and then like encrusting corals. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? true. They, you got to be real careful with where you put them and think to the future, not just what it looks like as uh, a little teeny plug today. Well, I think what had a hand in that of was our us trying to put all the corals in one. So another fail uh, was 
I mean, all of these things look awesome when they're tiny little frag plugs, and you, you feel like when you put them in there, they're far enough apart, they'll never, you don't even think about like years, five, six, five years down the road, sure. like how it's going to play out. The next one, man, uh, on this one for me was actually not enough fish, right? Oh yeah, so speaking of a lot of corals, when it gets to be like the nutrient uptake of the corals in here, mm. I mean, fish and fish waste, one of the best coral food providers out there. Yeah, so for me here, like really the fish is one of the things that actually adds tons and tons of color to the tank. The colors you might not get in the corals yep. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and re like a sense of movement. And I just wasn't a super big fish guy when we started this thing. So okay. like, I don't know, we'll get some Bachiantias in there and uh, we'll get uh, the some of my favorites with those little uh, sand sifting gobies mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, but like, I, I, we just didn't add, and now, man, it's actually really hard to get fish in here because the fish are like been in there for so long, they're super yeah. territorial. And we've actually lost a few fish that we've tried to add into there because these other guys are a little bastards. <laughs> you might actually see right here we have a, a gem tang that's living in this little box. And we're trying to get everybody used to them for a couple of weeks before we add them to the tank. Yeah. Uh, in the back, there's also an angelfish in there, and we're probably gonna add them both at the same time, just to add like disruption. So, to you know, add takes the aggression, spreads it out. I might even think about getting a third fish or, or some little ones or something to really kind of mess it up. Mess it up. But I want to add color and more movement to the tank, and it's been really hard because we didn't do that for so long. Mm. It'd be way easier up front. All right, so this might be the second worst thing that uh, I ever did. And I actually, I, I'm going to tell you a secret in a second that you guys are going to be <laughs> mind boggled by. But uh, it's using dirty Kato uh, in this tank. I mean, this was well before we knew what Kato could do. And we just wanted to refuge him in here. It was one of those avenues of, uh, of filtration that, we were, that you were teaching the public. And when you don't have a refugium set up and you're looking for Kato, well, you know, hey, Jason out here in the CS team, is, he's got a refugium, just grab some of his Kato, put it in, and now we can film it. Uh, big mistake. I don't know if it was Jason, was it? No, I don't know. Oh, okay. I, I'm uh, just gonna blame it on yeah, Jason, poor, but. Poor Jason. <laughs> uh, no, so I don't remember who I grabbed it out of here, but yeah. I went and grabbed some Kato and I threw it in here, and then I introduced uh, Aptasia through it. And I knew better, but I thought I, like, I looked at it or something. I don't know, man. Mm. I, maybe we're in a hurry or whatever. So whatever you do, under no circumstances, ever, ever, ever take uh, Kato out of your buddy's tank. Don't take it out of the fish store. Don't take it out of anywhere, man, that isn't sterile. There's a couple of places out there that sell uh, uh, sterile algae. Uh, the guys over at Algae Barn are one of them. But like, it is the number one way to introduce bristle worms and flat worms and like Aptasia. Uh, yeah. like, uh, it just it just like comes out of thin air of that stuff. And it's because it's being lit and the stuff just grows on it and all the like critters and stuff that are in there. And a lot of tanks are gonna have bristle worms one way, one way or another, but they don't all have them actually. If you dip your corals and you start with dry rock, you may never have anything like that. I mean, it could be. You don't a, want them in there. It could harbor algae too, like the bryopsis. How to get yes. it in this tank? It very well could have come from somebody having bryopsis in their tank. Now it's on the algae. Now it's in our tank. Yeah, absolutely. So don't do that under any circumstances. I'll never, ever, ever do that again, except for I did something worse. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I, I might have to take some blame for this one too. In that. Uh, when I was maintaining the 160, we saw the Aptasia. It wasn't a widespread problem. It wasn't this massive problem. So I, I asked you one day, I said, you know, can I use Aptasia X or Joe's Juice? And you said, no, can't, don't do it. Uh, fill it up with the coral gum. Well, I'm watching this Jedi mind trick and this Monopore and this uh, Satosa kind of get beaten back by this giant piece of Aptasia. And then finally it said, all right, you go ahead and nuke them with some Aptasia X. And then next thing we know, there's little baby Aptasias everywhere. And the big ones that we attacked did not die. Uh, we just stressed them out so much that they just felt the need to spread like the plague and probably uh, into some survival mode. And now it's plague-like conditions. Okay, then, because uh, apparently I'm not very smart, <laughs> I went to Josh and I'm like, Josh, we're gonna beat this Aptasia thing. Do you, you know how Josh, for reference, takes care of a lot of tanks here? And so I'm like, Josh, this is how we're gonna do it. 
The reason I know that next week when I come to this tank and I'm going to see no Aptasia is because you killed them all. Right? I want you to go in there and Aptasia X them all. Right? Nuked them. I want you to spend the next six hours Aptasia X in it. And then when they come back next week, you know the reason I'm not going to see them next week? It's because you killed them all. Right? And that is how we're going to beat this. Just sheer willpower and determination and man hours. We're going to beat them back. Absolute opposite. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Dude, we might as well have bred them. Uh, yeah, they're just exploded yeah. out of thin air. Not thin air, out of like, yeah. terrible advice. Uh, there were so many. So I actually think at this point, man, that like, killing them is a terrible idea. Mm. Uh, and, and it may be, and I can't tell you, at least with that Tasia Axel, it was bad uh, for me. And other people may have a different experience. But when you uh, spray them with Joe's juice, it may be different because it definitely kills them immediately mm. if you can get them before they shrink up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is just like Kelkwasser and lemon juice or something like yeah. that. Uh, but, like, I don't know. I just find I, I would not tell anybody to kill them anymore. And so what I do in almost every case, if I only have a couple, if I, anybody says, oh, my God, I got one, the first <laughs> thing you do is just go epoxy it right over it. Like kind of nudge it into its little hole and then fill it up with super glue or epoxy or whatever and let it die in there. Hopefully it's like, you know, encapsulated in there. So even little spores and stuff or whatever they're doing, or gametes yeah. or whatever they are, don't come out. Uh, in some really porous rock, they may actually find their way out. It's, you know, hard to say, but uh, that would be my step one. There's a couple other things that we did. Uh, and uh, like, you know, everybody says these things. So I'll give you my own experience with okay. all of these things. Right? 250 plus peppermint shroom. Didn't work. I, I mean, when he says 250, I think it really was that it, many. I think it was. I mean, we bought so many, man, because there was so many Aptasia in there, we just had to beat it back. Just dump a bunch in there. Yeah, so the problem with those guys is they tend to stay like underneath, underneath mm -hmm. right? We got a lot of flow in this tank, so they didn't go out in the front. They didn't really like walking around on the coral itself. There's so much coral in here. Yeah. Uh, they didn't go like into the bird's nest and whatever. They just. Didn't do it. Well, not to mention, like, we're at the same time, we're also shoving a lot of food down in this tank because we have Tons nitrate. Of food. So they have, like, a food source. So, I mean, why would I eat Aptasia when I'm, like, I got a whole bunch of food and stuff here? Plus, we had the snowflake eel that just was a full belly all oh, the, the dwarf time. The Mori. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So the, um, his belly was full all the time because he was dining on shrimp every he day. Eventually ate all too big. <laughs> yeah, right. and so that's why I bought so many partially, yeah. by the way, is because I knew mm. full well the guy was going to eat some of them. Uh, didn't but, set him back, though. Uh, no, it didn't work at all. Uh, and so there's some arguments to be made about whether or not we use the right peppermint shrimp. It's kind of hard to tell what the right peppermint shrimp is. but it's a High velocity flow environment. Not probably not your They didn't best. go to the areas where you, they needed to be eaten. Yeah. So I just don't think it was effective. Mm -hmm. So the same thing that we had, the same kind of, I think, problem was with the Bergia. So, you know, like some people like go out and buy five Bergia or whatever. I, like, I didn't see any scenario where five Bergia was going to be beat this battle. Mm -hmm. So we bought like a hundred for Bergia, you know. Uh, is it Salty Critter, I think? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Salty Underground. Uh, salty Underground. And so they helped us out with a lot of those things. And they absolutely work. You can watch them oh, yeah. eating them away, right? And you can have watch them. They will have babies and they will spread around the tank. But we had a really high flow tank here. And so those Same little guys kind of like hang out in the areas. They don't venture out uh, to some of the places we wanted them. So I think we might try them again and maybe slow the flow down for a period of time and place them in the exact areas that we want them or whatnot. They do work, but even a hundred of them didn't totally eradicate it out of mm. the system, right? In our case, I've heard uh, the opposite, but also there's so many, I'm sure that they're part of why the tank isn't completely overrun right now. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They're probably still in there doing something. We also tried copper band, right? Yeah, we did, uh, and True, actually. really delicate fish from uh, from my experience and from listening to other people's experience. Like, uh, if you don't, it, one, if they're not attracted, they're, if they're not attracted to Aptasia, because right out of the gate, not everything's attracted to, uh, to Aptasia. Um, but if they're not, then you have to get them to feed, and a lot of them are really delicate feeders. There's people that make elaborate feeding, you know, uh, types of mechanisms to f to feed them. Really delicate fish. Uh, high maintenance fish and to dump them in here and hope that well we had seen success in the frag system that was right off the set here uh, where we had a, uh, we had a butterfly 
uh, copper band or marginalized butterfly. And we had a few peppermint shrimp, and it wiped out all the aptasia in that frag system. Mm -hmm. Not a heavy, high flow type system, uh, really a smaller footprint, so everything is easily accessible, more concentrated, whatnot. Uh, it just didn't work out here. Yeah, so peppermint shrimp actually have worked in other systems. Oh, yeah. It didn't work in this one. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. Copper band, too, like the super high flow, and the inhabitants of this tank tend to uh, cordon off everybody over in the corner and they, you know, freak them out. Yeah. And like super high flow, that tank, that fish just doesn't seem to do really well so uh, that didn't work for us uh, in, the, in our case uh, and we got really healthy ones by the way uh, oh, yeah. they were pre quarantine and all that stuff and it just didn't work out so uh, like what else we also did the tile fish the, yeah the file fish were in here we have one large file fish in here we have a pygmy file fish that we just added uh, but I think that's the large one that we've actively seen eat uh, If you sit there and stare at him, you'll see him walk or swim around and pluck him off yeah. and eat him whole, right? Uh, I think that he is probably the most effective. And it's one of those things where any of these solutions, if you dump him in the tank and expect him to work in the next week, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, but he did not eat any Aptasia in the beginning. No. Yeah, so now he does. Uh, and he just swims around and he enjoys it and looks for him. But it probably took him. I don't know, three, four, or five months, or whatever, to show any interest in him. And now it's part of his regular diet. But it took a long time, mm. you know, to, to get there. So, Aptasia has been a really, really big challenge. And it came Bang. from the Cato, which was don't, don't, <laughs> there's anything you listen to me from, and like, don't do that mistake. But I'm going to tell you, I did it again. Uh, <laughs> kind of. So, on the uh, XXL 750, uh, we needed a source of coralline algae for that tank. Oh, that's true. <laughs> right? And so, like, at the time, and we were just letting it grow up the back here, and there's a big chunk of purple coralline algae that, like, was just coming, I just pulled it off, and I'm like, I'm looking at it, like, there's no Aptasia growing on this, mm. or, like, and I, like, I rinsed it off and stuff, and then I just crumbled it up into the 750, and I introduced Aptasia. Now we have Aptasia in the 750. Uh, you know, and so it just goes to show, man, we all make mistakes, and we all, like, often make the same mistake many, many times. Yeah. Uh, and then you kind of cheat the system thinking, well, the, I don't know, it looks clean. No, it wasn't. It was stupid. And everybody laugh, laughs at me now, including myself. Uh, that was stupid. That's but, why it's so important to listen to these fails and actually, like, they will happen. It will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, uh, just yeah. promise us. So don't just because listen. you can't see uh, the pest in, in the water, or even on the rock, or on the frag, Assume does it's not there. mean that it, it like it does not, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you can see it, then for sure it means it's there. But if you can't see it, it means garbage. It doesn't mean anything. Assume it's there. It, it, assume that all the pests are on there. So in hindsight, I should have taken it out of some other systems that I knew uh, uh, were clean and didn't have any Aptasia. I, I wish I would have done that. It just seemed like a really easy source. Mm. Uh, it was a mistake. So Aptasia, 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 ah. don't put it in your tank, big fail. All right, so I won't say this like didn't work, uh, but the next thing is a short cycle and dry rock, mm. right? So by short cycle, like we're all used to live, live rock at one point, you know, many, many years ago. Uh, and then you kind of like expect the dry rock to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what magic thing stability means or doesn't mean or whatnot, but it just takes a few extra months, right? Right. And so, uh, you know, with this tank, I, I just say this one started with like cement rock, you know, and had that purple yep. like epoxy on it. Yeah. And we threw all the frags in and most of them lived, but it was a way higher mortality rate, like, you know, probably 10% or than, something. Than what we should have seen, yeah. Yeah, than what we've seen on other tanks, yeah. right, that have been established for a long time. And so if you're going to do a full-blown SPS tank and dump money into uh, corals, like, do test corals first. Yeah. And, and in reality, man, just enjoy your fish for the first six months. So related to that, uh, we also had uh, no water changes. That yeah, didn't work. That didn't work. And uh, it wasn't because, uh, so no water changes was that uh, less frequent water changes when we moved to the Triton method. And the, that was the understanding is, okay, you're dosing the major, uh, you're dosing the major, the minor, and the trace elements. Uh, all of that's taken care of. The refugium is handling the uh, nitrate and phosphate uh, export. You know, your filtration's in place. There's really, why would we need to do water changes at that point as long as we were maintaining you know, a proper salinity and everything else is being maintained? 
um, until the re ICP report told you to do a water change. But if you don't do them, bad things can happen. And so if you don't listen to the, I do a 10% uh, water changes for the next four weeks, uh, no water changes, big mistake. Yeah, I, I just, did, it didn't work for me. And like, I, I, I really bought into it. Like it made a lot of sense to me and I just really wanted to try it and then share the results with you guys. And uh, that means you have to follow those ITP reports. When it comes in and tells you that things are bad, you actually have to listen to it. If you don't, uh, expect mortalities very soon after. Right. right? Uh, and we did that. We didn't. We didn't do them all the way when it was uh, whenever it said. And sometimes we wouldn't send the things in on time and whatever. And it just turned out for me that like sending out test kits and trying to follow all this stuff is like more mad scientist and effort than just doing the water changes to begin with. Related to that quarantine the fish. Oh yeah. So we didn't quarantine. We mentioned last week we lost a lot of fish in the beginning. Yeah, it's one of those secrets that most people didn't know, but mm -hmm. now they do. Yeah. Uh, had we had quarantined, would we have seen a higher survivability of those fish? No, actually, because I, I didn't know how to do it right back then. Yeah. Right? I still you actually, to, it's in my skill set. Have to do it right. Yeah, I, I like the people that quarantine, uh, I say, A, the like most engaged reefers, often super, super into fish. And at the time, man, fish just wasn't my thing. Coral was Coral my thing, is, right? Yeah. Still kind I'm of kind of transferring boat. over to that, that area, area of fish where I'm getting a bigger appreciation for the fish as well. People that worked at fish stores mm. usually do it, know it really well because they did it for a living. But most people don't actually add enough fish to a system to ever really have honed that skill. And so and then you go read and there's so much advice. And the advice on the internet usually goes one of two things. The wrong advice, mm. uh, like it's just this plethora of, of my ways that like it's really hard to get through. Yeah. And then there's the points where you, you aim at the guys that really know what they're doing and they do, they're super, super smart. But they have a way of making it so complex that you really, it's hard to emulate and do, right? Yeah. Like it, it's just pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of knowledge on every last thing. And How ID, do I follow like, it? It's, it's, it's just like you get mm. inundated, man. And so like only the most engaged get through that gauntlet to the other side and implement the right way. We're going to fix that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to fix it for myself. How to? And then I'm going to share that knowledge with you. Yeah. Right? And so first thing is the way I fixed it is I just buy my fish from Elliot over at uh, Marine Collectors. I'm sure he's like now at capacity <laughs> and I've ruined my chances of getting more fish from him. Yeah. Like some people are, but basically he's just going to, like he's going to do it for you. Them. He takes the fish, treats them like they're sick, treats them for all the stuff and uh, keeps them for a few weeks and then make sure not just that they're like eating and stuff, but of course that, mm -hmm. but also that they like been treated like they have all these things. And then he sends them to me. And of all the fish that we have gotten from him for a whole variety of systems, never one have, once have we gotten a sick fish. But there's an, you know, it is a cost associated. Yeah. But you don't have to have the cost. We're going to give you the skill set. So I'm gonna fly out to, to LA at some point here, and he is going to teach me exactly how to set up a quarantine system, and, and not a super expensive one, man, like one the real person would set up, yeah. and how to do this properly so you can do it at home. Okay, so this has actually been kind of hinted at before, but one of the other fails came up in a question, like it was the Ask 52 FAQ. Yeah. And it's, can a fuge work too well? My answer was, uh, your, your answer was sort of like, no, I don't think it can. Then we turned it into a BRS TV Investigates episode and we found the opposite. Yeah, I was wrong. <laughs> it, can work, it can work too well. Uh, and then it turns into a, a tunable type of filtration method that you really need to pay attention to, especially if you're doing it correctly. You really need to pay attention to uh, how it's being implemented uh, and then adjusting it to dial it into what you're putting in for nutrition. So the thought process was that like a, you know, the ocean's reefs are at, you know, near zero uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm. Uh, there's lots of food though in those reefs mm. that are actually being flown in. So they're getting nitrogen and phosphorus in different forms, right? Yeah. That which kind of led to the like high input, nutrient input, high export, still maintain reasonably low nitrogen and phosphorus, but like the reefs, add all that particular food, amino acids and proteins and stuff. They have all those fish swimming around in them, pooing and whatever, mm -hmm. stirring up detritus and all that kind of stuff. So I guess I was just wrong, man. Like in an aquarium that if you don't put hardly any food or protein in it and they don't have, they're missing all of that, 
and you have zero, zero nitrogen and phosphorus, yeah, okay. you're gonna starve the corals out. <laughs> yeah. So another one we got here, well, this was a really big problem uh, that fail on a variety of fronts is... It, this was changing who maintained the 160 over and over and over again. So conceptually, big bright idea, let's build a tank, let's follow it for 52 weeks. Okay, now we're all set up and going, who's gonna take care of it because you're a busy guy, all of us are busy out here. A lot of us have our own tanks in here too, so in comes the help of like, a CS agent was designated to help run this tank and maintain the tank, do the zeal vid, do the water changes, maintenance the tank, feed the fish, do all this. Uh, well, then that CS agent would get in charge of something else and somebody else would come and take care of it. It was a round robin of uh, people taking care of it. It was you, then it was Zach, then it was me, then it was uh, Tex, and then it was Josh. And now, I mean, we finally settled on, all right, out of all the tanks here in the office, this one, the 750, the ULMs, there's a handful of them that are critical that somebody takes care of constantly every day and not get wrapped up in the other work uh, so that these tanks fail because they absolutely start. This tank started to fail because uh, I'm busy doing some other things. It would ebb and flow is what it yeah. would do. It would, it would react to the person taking care of it true. and their different habits, right? True, true. And so for the first 52 weeks, I did it. I came back here, dropped the little blue drops, and I really enjoyed it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then after the whole uh, series was kind of like done, I just don't have the bandwidth to like take care of a whole slew of tanks, you know? So like, right? like who else can help us out, right? Yeah. I take care of these tanks, and then we'll come back and film them later. Uh, and so this is where it changed for me. Mm is I went down and when I was watching what the WWC team was doing and like how awesome all those tanks oh, were, yeah, yeah, there yeah. was one thing beyond all the other stuff I saw yep. is, you know the reason that these tanks all look awesome? It's because the same person takes care of these things every single day. Mm -hmm. They have a clipboard that they follow every day. They're totally accountable for this. Mm -hmm. And they know the tank. They know what to spot and look for. They have a history and they're in tune with it. Just makes sense. Right? It makes sense. And I came back and I'm like, guys, we got to hire somebody here. So after that, though, you know, getting Josh in here, all the tanks did a turn for the best oh, because yeah, for he's sure. here doing it all day, every day. So that's kind of a, a, a weird little thing. Probably doesn't really apply to you guys a whole lot uh, because you're probably taking care of yourself. But it, it also reminds you to be in tune with the tank. But that was a big thing here that didn't work for us. It's constantly really changing out. And you probably saw bits of it ebb and flow in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of leads in. So that is all of the didn't work. Yes. Yeah, so there's going to be a third episode of this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, these guys have got so long, we just had to break it up a little bit. I mean, you guys deserve the, uh, a three-part BRS 160 update, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I agree. So the, this is the thing that we're going to do next week, is I'm going to give you all the things that I wish we had done. Yes. Right? And then I'm going to tell you where the tank is going Ooh. in the future. Yeah, right? this is exciting. So uh, we got the whole 52 weeks of play uh, playlist right here. So click on that. You want to watch everything. You can see last week's uh, update if you missed it on all the good things that happened. And then next week, you're going to see all the things I wish I had done and where this tank is going in the future.